Hello you beautiful people, today we are talking about Guild Wars, specifically the world building in Guild Wars 1 and 2. Why? Well, I was browsing Reddit lately and stumbled across a post by user Juggernux asking whether or not the map in Guild Wars 2 makes any sense. Spoiler, it's not too bad. But since it's an evolution of the Guild Wars 1 map set 250 years in the future, we have to look at the context a bit. So let's start with the map of Guild Wars 1. Before we get into it, I quickly want to mention that I have only played Guild Wars 1 for a short time and then Guild Wars 2 for way too long. So please excuse me if I disregard any magical shenanigans, feel free to add anything about Guild Wars 1 lore in the comments and correct me if I get anything wrong. Alright, this is the map of Guild Wars 1. First of all, we need to keep in mind that this is a video game, so it's basically a scaled down world. The map is supposed to represent a whole continent, even though it doesn't take terribly long to pass any of these regions. That's just a premise we have to suspend our disbelief over, or the whole logic will fall apart anyway. But how do we know this is actually a continental scale? Well, we have a lot of biomes here. We got some greenery here, which is probably the equator, featuring a lot of rain and therefore rainforest. Above that we have some arid desert-like climate, and then above that we have temperate climate. And finally there should be a polar region, which is not very big on this map. So if we compare this to our planet, this looks pretty much like our northern hemisphere. So that's where we are, and we are looking at the map of half a planet. So it's a fairly big map, even though in game you could casually walk from one side to the other in less than a day. And I'm actually planning on taking the time. I'm gonna casually walk from one end of Tyria to the other, and of course provide some commentary on world building the whole way. So that's gonna be fun, but it's gonna take me two or three weeks until that video comes out. So if you're interested, make sure to hit the bell so you don't miss it. Okay, so if we consider this map the northern hemisphere of a planet, we can already say that these arid desert-like regions above the equator are perfectly fine and in the right place. I also like that it extends upward behind that mountain ridge. It tells us that there's a rain shadow here, which means that heavy rain clouds would come in from the west, struggle to pass the mountain ridge and lose all their water, supporting lush vegetation on the west side and of course this will become snow in higher regions, so this makes sense as well, but the clouds are never reaching the other side, which makes for a pretty dry region on the east side. By the fact that the wind seems to be blowing from west to east in this latitude, we could technically determine the spin and size of the planet, and from that we could even gauge tides and stuff. But this is all fairly advanced, so I'll leave it out. As always, if you want to go that deep, I recommend the very easy yet in-depth worldbuilding tutorials by Artifexian. One more thing about these mountains. I like that there's more vegetation down here, where the glacier water runs down and meets drier regions. I think that's totally possible as well. It would also cause some vaporization, so we could actually extend the green zone further eastward. But let's assume there's usually an east wind blowing in this zone, moving these rain clouds the other way. If we go all the way to the west, we got some volcanic activity in the middle of the ocean, forming some islands over time, which is totally plausible and hot AF. I'll see myself out. And it's great for having a lava level in the game. The fact that your clothes and skin would burn off if you even get close to lava is a topic for another video, I guess. So all in all, I like the bottom part of the map. The only thing I can really criticize is this set of islands, which I'm pretty sure would be a little greener since they are subject to rain and almost in a temperate climate. Think of Sicily, for example. Every now and then, if the wind changes, they would also get some volcanic ash, which is a great fertilizer. I'd make these islands nice and green, full of Mediterranean-like vegetation. Now for the top part of this map, which is fine, but I also don't love it. So what exactly is there to criticize? If you look at these mountain ranges, it seems that we have at least four tectonic plates colliding here. I think it's at least plausible that this would push all of this region up high enough so it's all covered in snow and glaciers all year round. But it all looks a little too clean and cramped and forced to me, it screams video game right in your face. And I get it, the devs needed some different biomes so the game doesn't become too repetitive. But I think it could have been done better, just put all of this a little further up north. On the right side of that we have the Ascalon ruins. On this map it looks like a barren wasteland, but it normally shouldn't be. In Guild Wars 2 this region curiously looks like it's in perpetual autumn, while in Guild Wars 1 it looks almost normal apart from some orangish trees and it's described like this. Once Ascalon was a beautiful fertile land of rolling green countryside and magnificent cities. Her people were viewed as grim by the neighbors. This was perhaps to be expected 
given their never-ending war against the aggressive Char. Indeed, it was their unfailing vigilance, their great northern wall, and the blood they shed each year to defend it that had protected not only Ascalon, but also Krita, and or through the ages. Then came the invasion, and with it, the Suring. I'm not sure if these lands would be so fertile and beautiful as they are described here, given that the region is surrounded by mountains on all sides. This is basically an intermontane plateau, like Tibet, or maybe not as high an elevation, it might even be more of a basin. It's hard to tell, but I'd go with plateau. In any case, I think there would not be a lot of rain here. Given that we have already established that the wind is blowing from the west, rain clouds can't pass these two mountain ridges very well, and all the other sides are closed off too. But mountains on all sides could also mean that glacier or spring water could be coming down from everywhere, forming freshwater lakes. So if this is like a basin, it could even form its own little climate, with water vaporizing from the lakes and raining down on the eastern side of the basin, where vegetation could then grow a little higher. So yeah, I'd guess vegetation would vary a lot within that region, which would be pretty cool for a video game. I smell a missed opportunity. Like I already said, on this map the region is a barren landscape, not because it's like Tibet, but because the land has been pillaged and burned by the Char and their magic. This event was called the Searing. Now, I have some very mixed feelings about this whole event and the Char themselves. While they are a cool and way more unique cat people race than in other games, they are this trope of an evil force destroying everything in their wake and turning the whole landscape into this barren wasteland. This always puts me off a little from a world building standpoint. While it shows very well the destructive force of that hostile nation, it leaves them empty handed themselves. It works well if it's like one wild mob just pillaging the land, robbing and murdering its people and then moving on. But as far as I understand it, the Char are trying to claim these lands for themselves. They probably wouldn't do very well if they just burned everything to the ground before settling there. Sure, they could plant crops, which, spoilers, they don't. At least I don't remember any Char farmhouses or fields in the game, even though they have cattle ranches and there are balls of hay stacked there. Where does that come from if they don't do any agriculture? And by the way, I'm not even sure if they can eat plants. They might be carnivores for all I know. So burning the forest with all its wildlife could completely deprive them of any food source and building material. Apart from eating humans, I guess. So in my opinion, a more likely scenario would be the Char being nowhere near the destructive legion that they are. They would be small hunting tribes roaming the lands and staying only as long as they can find food. Nomads, basically. That's how I would frame them. They could still be brutal beasts destroying everything in their wake and be feared by the humans. And if we continue that logic, they would need a very good communication system between the tribes to still form big armies and overrun human cities. Also, for nomadic tribes it's very unlikely they'd be as technologically advanced as they are, which to me proves that they are omnivores, leaving me with the conclusion that there should be more char farmhouses all over the map, more like the human starting area, where almost every little village is contributing something. Thing. To be honest, I'm pretty sure that's what the writers of Guild Wars had in mind when they created the Chars. So let's say they are omnivores. Burning down everything, building their own stuff on top of it, and settling down with agriculture and livestock could actually work. It's basically the same thing that humans have been doing with the Brazilian rainforest, unfortunately. For building stuff and sustaining themselves at first, they would have needed to haul everything from far away. Granted, the Guild Wars 2 Chars have big machinery too, but 250 years in the past, their technology painted a different picture. It would have been a hassle, and frankly pretty dumb when you consider that everything is there, and they could have just killed everyone and used the land and the resources for themselves instead of burning it all. So all in all, if they're omnivores, it's plausible, but they should definitely do some agriculture, even more so around the Black Citadel, where there are a lot of residents. The next region on our map is Krita, which is your typical central European medieval setting in a temperate climate zone, placed perfectly on the map. Nothing to talk about here really, boring old human stuff, moving on. The Meguma jungle on the west side of the map is a region I would have an issue with if it weren't for dragon magic. Normally jungle or rainforest will mostly occur around the equator, but here fueled by the elder dragon Mordromoth's magic, all the plant life is going crazy with huge vines and stuff going everywhere, and even plant life is reaching sentience, birthing the Silvari from the mother tree, so that's really strong magic and there's no way we can judge it like a normal map. So yeah, gotta go with plausible because magic for this one. Above the Maguma jungle though, there are the Maguma Wastes. A desert basically, with a lot of canyons. 
this is one region I don't really like. And I'm not talking about sand being rough and coarse and getting everywhere. I just think it has no business being all the way up there. I guess it's modeled after the Grand Canyon, which is located in the subtropical climate zone. And I think this is where this belongs. Now, if we were to leave it up here, even though we don't know where the North Pole is on the map, I feel like this would be in the temperate climate zone. So either this would look like the Mongolian desert with snow and sand, or more likely, given the elevation and the nearby sea and that huge lake, I really think there should be some precipitation, so some plant life and probably some snow and glaciers on these mountains. And I mean, could it really be that much lower than the Shiver Peak Mountains, especially the top part? I don't think so. Our guild halls would be in the snow or at least nice and green. And lastly we have Kantha. Kanta? Kanta? Kanta. An Asian looking region with Chinese and Japanese inspired culture and architecture. Now if we can trust these hand drawn maps and the equator is still in this place, then unfortunately this continent is not in the right place. It should either be lower or way up high in a temperate climate zone. If we were to leave it here, I would put rainforest on it and maybe some kind of savanna in the southern part. So the forest in northern Kanta would be a lot thicker and look more like the Philippines, for example. And I actually like this idea a lot more than just copy-pasting an Asian culture and putting it in the right climate zone. And I want to go on a little tangent here. Taking inspiration from real-life cultures and mixing them up with other regions is actually a great world-building tool. It's always fun to think of the implications of how this culture would adapt to the challenges of this new climate. This will help a great deal with developing a cool and unique culture for your universe and still giving off an Asian vibe for example. But keep in mind that if you take the Ming Dynasty for example, place them in a rainforest and change a couple things about them, you can't call them the Ming Dynasty anymore. We need to avoid misrepresentation and cultural appropriation. That's exactly the issue I had with the Viking game Valheim. The devs just took Viking culture as it is, mythology and all, and put it in the game, but they also chose to go for a lot of fantasy elements in weapons and armor, and there's no way to tell what's still Viking and what's already fantasy, apart from the obvious stuff like black metal swords and magical hammers. It's watering down the image of the real world historical cultures, and especially Viking culture is a victim of that. Did you think this is what a Viking looks like? Nah, -uh. you've been fooled by Hollywood. Archaeology paints a different picture. Even my clothes are inspired by and closer to real Viking clothes than the Valheim or Assassin's Creed armor. Even though wrapping yourself in fur and 10 different belts looks pretty badass, but it's just fantasy and it should be labeled that way. So yeah, if you use a historical thing for your story, do your research. Or change a couple things and don't call it the same name. It's that easy. End of rant. But if you want to hear me rant some more about Vikings and their weapons, click the link at the end of this video or find it in the description. And now back to Guild Wars. I think I've talked about everything on the Guild Wars 1 map and the easiest fix for everything that I labeled wrong would be to just switch out these two regions. All problem solved. With the char being omnivores and all the magic going on in Ascalon, I think it can stay the way it is. So we're done for Guild Wars 1. So let's see what has changed in the 250 years between Guild Wars 1 and 2. The map has changed quite a bit. But nothing has changed in the desert and Kantar isn't even on the map, so I'm just gonna assume it hasn't moved and is still in the same place. Not that it couldn't have moved. At some point during these 250 years, the Elder Dragon of Death and Shadow, called Zaitan, Zaitan has used his magic to raise Or, the sunken city of the gods, from below the sea, which is now overrun by his undead hordes. If I understand correctly, this funky action raised the water levels, flooding the adjacent areas and washing up hostile undead on the shores. That now spread his corruption. In bird culture, this is considered a dick move. And sure, from a writing perspective, it's your classic undead business. But whether you like it or not, it's just a trope that you might think is lame, but it's not bad writing. There's nothing that hasn't been done before, and it doesn't change anything about the quality of the writing if it's been done one time or a thousand times. And speaking of which, if you think about it, the whole thing is actually super well written. These are not your typical undead. They have agency, they can talk, they even build their own structures. And they even have a motivation, what with being the extension of Zaitan's mind and such. They also like hanging out on the beach. Relatable. If we move a little further north, we can also see that there is now a volcano that has been melting glaciers. This glacier water, together with the raising of ore, has been raising the water levels, flooding parts of the desert, where there is now more greenery, and also parts of Krita, which is now more swampy. This all makes sense to me, maybe I'm thinking a little too simple here, but it's a good idea and it makes the map look much nicer in my opinion and more realistic. But hold on a minute, 
there are more land masses now than before. Where did those come from? This is either an inconsistency, but I think we can explain this away with the raising of ore. Maybe it had an impact on much more than just that region and raised a lot of the surrounding area as well, as we also see in the northwest, where the volcano has been growing quite a bit and it has probably been breaking out. Which could also be because of another dragon called Primordus with the element of fire, but even if that weren't the case, I think the earthquakes from raising ore could be enough to make both of these volcanoes break out. And in case of this volcano, spitting a lot of molten rock into the sea would make more islands, so I can see the reasoning behind that. Oh, and if you're wondering about this huge purple scar, take a wild guess. Yeah, another dragon. Also, I know I said that everything has been done before early in this video, but a dragon raging and burning parts of the map, leaving behind huge scars in the landscape, that sounds awfully familiar to me. Oh well, I guess it's becoming a trope on its own. That being said, I like that the Guild Wars dragons all stand for their own thing. They all have their own element and they are having this power struggle. And their designs are pretty good too. Well, except for Mordremoth. I feel like this one was designed around the boss battle instead of the other way around and it always looked kinda silly to me. But that's just my own opinion. What do you think of Mordremoth? Put it in the comments. So overall I like the changes to this map. I think they improved it. Well, apart from one thing. What is that? Are you telling me that humans built this gigantic city, the biggest one in the game, in only 250 years and it's so big that it's showing on a continental scale map? For comparison, New York is a smaller dot on the map of the US and it took us 400 years to build it that big. And we even had a technological advantage over these like, what, late medieval people that are just now starting with industrialization? And have you seen this thing? It's crazy. It's standing on a hollow hill. Are you kidding me? In what world? There is no way this could exist. And to be honest, there is more like this if you look at some of the other capitals. But I will save that rant for another video. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to rate the video. You can also help me with the algorithm by sharing and leaving a comment. And if you really like my content and you want to support me, you can do so on patreon.com slash madmuffin to get access to a lot of tabletop RPG stuff and creative stuff I'm putting out, get videos early and of course get a shout out at the end of each video. Last but not least, you can follow me on Instagram for some dank memes and channel updates. I hope to see you there or for my next video, which will be a casual stroll through the Guild Wars world. Maybe it's even gonna be a mini series. So until then, stay safe, have a wonderful time, muffin out. But if you want to hear me rant some more about Vikings and their weapons, click the link. The link. I also like the new round, uh, round mitch.